Hi, I'm E.T. Leger from Montreal, Quebec. I am the owner and operator of Leger Landscapes, a landscaping company specializing in paver restoration in Montreal. We pursue excellence to deliver the best customer satisfaction experience ever. And I am a hardscaper. Welcome to the I am a hardscaper series on the How to Hardscape podcast, where we sit down and interview a hardscape business owner and do a deep dive on how they became a hardscaper and how they operate their business. Quick announcement, if you've ever thought about getting the budget and estimate spreadsheet and bookkeeping spreadsheet on how to hardscape, the prices will be increasing as we've got an upgrade coming out later this week. If you purchase now, you'll get that upgrade for free. But once that upgrade is released, prices will be increasing. You can find out more at howtohardscape.com and find the budget and estimate spreadsheet, as well as if you join the How to Hardscape members only platform, you can get 25% off of this price. That is a partner discount that's included at members.howtohardscape.com. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Okay, E.T., let's get started to know a little bit more about yourself, how you got into the hardscape industry. Can you give our audience a little bit of background, a little bit of context about yourself and what led to starting your own business? Perfect, Michael. Well, listen, uh, we started off, my brother and I, we were, you know, young, I guess, 11, 11, 12 years old. I remember we started thinking, like, how can we, like, start a business? How can we make money to buy, uh, you know, parts for mountain bikes and things like that? And what happened is we we got to just thinking about lawn mowing and we cut our grandpa's lawn, cut his hedge on our cottage. And then we started, um, picked up an old lawnmower. My dad probably helped us out with that. And what we did is we started walking like basically like two kilometers, go cut this one old lady's lawn. And it, it grew to a few other clients in the area that wanted it done too. So we grew, we could have to do a lot of walking and not a lot of mowing. And this was kind of getting a bit tedious. And we figured we could pull the pull the lawnmowers on our bikes to be faster to go, you know, at the cottage on the weekend to do it. And then we started bringing this concept back to where we lived at home. And during the, you know, the rest of the season, we started kind of um, going out with electric mowers and, and electric trimmers, trying to, you know, start doing some type of landscaping. Only problem is electric mowers. Um, you actually, you know, show the client's house, the breaker's not on, and you're just like, man, you just have to keep walking. So it, it kind of got frustrating uh, to do that. But at the same time, it was it was a bit of a, you know, just stepping up. And I remember, like, other landscapers, like, laughing at us, like, what are these guys doing? You know, and probably look kind of silly, too. Like, let's just be honest, like, two 12, 13-year-olds or, or less just trying to make a buck. And But that was kind of the, the ground up for us. And um, eventually, we started, you know, getting, you know, we had almost 30 clients eventually. And then um we actually were like dad like this is too much for us he was my, my dad was a big inspiration he's an entrepreneur himself and and really got us you know into into it but eventually we're like dad like we just can't do this like just walking and stuff so anyways we had our licenses he sold us like an old van and like or rented us his van and a trailer and then we would go start cutting lawn stuff and that, that was the beginning that was just like the lawn mowing part and then we started doing little jobs like that i remember the first time i laid a paver walkway um we did every single stone individually on like not even on a setting bed just with the levels and stuff and we're like this gotta be a better way and it's like before youtube and stuff so like no one's got like no one's got like these uh like channels or how to we didn't know like you know hardscape or, or other other conventions or shows we had no idea so we just kind of so yeah we saw these two other guys using two by fours to like scream so we try that out and just kind of just just went at it without much training and then Eventually, it got to be a point where we had up to you know seventy clients, and we just couldn't really handle it. I went and worked at a, a, a cemetery. Um, sorry, I would cut my lawns during the day, and then sorry, and then the evening weekends, and I would actually work with my brother at a, at a graveyard. Uh, we worked and we were cutting on the grass in the cemetery, and it was kind of a cool story because we started off there, and my sister joined us there. Eventually, we got there. We were told right off the bat, "All right, you guys are new. You're not going to." You'll be cutting grass all summer. You're not going to, you know, move up in the company because, you know, no one moves up here. I was like, all right, it's all good. So we ended up, uh, my brother and I both, you know, we're both hard workers, good work ethic, you know, solid. My parents thought us really good work ethic. And we started cutting and and eventually uh, people were catching on that we're cutting a lot more than everybody else. And the boss was like trying to figure this out because the cemetery was all the way up on a hill uh, and the office was down at the front. He'd come check, it, check up on the guys, but but he had like five minutes by the time he'd get there. So everyone would know that, okay, boss, there's, let's get working. And sometimes they have like guys napping. And then one guy was like on patrol, like sentry duty. Long story short, he figured out a way the boss like snuck in like a neighbor's property, like 
around the cemetery and like snuck in the bushes like 007 style and then just basically checked out and like found it could tell that okay these two guys are hustling everyone else is like super chill not really doing anything so pretty soon my brother and i got promoted to tractors and excavators and we got like we moved up so we're like these little new guys in town and we're not really cutting grass anymore we're trying to learn about you know bigger pieces of equipment and a little bit more about sod and getting things ready so Overall, it was a pretty good job. I mean, I was over six thousand people on my uh, first day at the job, so you're 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 high up in the company already, right? So uh, it was a it was a little bit of a, a a cool intro for us to like get into um, get into landscaping, get into hardscaping a little bit. But then eventually, you know, we we got 16, 17, 18 years old, and school was wasn't for me. And uh, I went tried taking science, wasn't for me. Uh, then I went to social science and love the psychology aspect, but it wasn't quite enough. I was like, I don't really want to go into that. And we saw at the school, there was a fair for a, a hardscaper course, like a, basically a, a one year course to take a landscaping degree. And I said, all right, try it out. My brother and I, we were twin. I have a twin brother uh, who also still does. Uh, he does more tree work now, but he started off in landscaping together. And we basically said, we're going to go to this course. We drove his uh, 99 Tercel uh, an hour each way for the whole winter and it was uh, it was quite the experience and we learned a lot and the next next spring uh by then it's fast forward now 2009 is when we started our companies uh both together and that was when we we both started our our own separate companies we worked together for a bit didn't quite work out we went back to separate and i went more into hardscaping and then he went more towards you know maintenance and then tree work we both did a combination of both but eventually you both kind of found our niches so that's a with a long story of how we how we got started there's a lot more details i could add in my dad was really instrumental helping us out bailing us out a few times and things are going quite well the way it should be but uh overall uh, it's been a journey and now i'm i'm really into my niche my brother's into his niche and it's been it's been a long journey but we're real thankful for uh for where it's been can we get into a little bit of the family family dynamic there uh especially with a partnership you two working uh beside each other and then eventually when you decided to separate ways and start your own businesses uh what was the the catalyst to start your own separate businesses there uh was it quite specifically that he had an interest in the landscape maintenance side of things you had an interest in hardscape or was there a bit more to it where you know working as a family can be quite difficult well, we've always worked for my dad, like, you know, doing renovations and stuff. And and it's a different mindset where, you know, uh, my brother and I, we were, we're, we're best friends, but working together just wasn't work out. We both have, you know, we're both leaders in, in our own in our own way. And, and it, we just have the same vision for where we wanted things to go. And, uh, you know, I was ready to take it really seriously and kind of really start plugging away and growing company. He was more not quite sure if he was going to photography or something else. So it wasn't, we never had like headed out like a big fight or anything. But at one point in time, when he did work for me, we're like, this is not going to work out. And we just valued our relationship more than the work. So it worked out that we, you know, we, we split amicably and it was a, a good, uh, a good break. I know some families, you know, they, they have horror stories, how things work out, but it was for us, it was, it was good. And we, we still, you know, we talk almost every day and we refer each other a lot of work. We're not, we're, we're not at odds at all. Like, I mean, we, have, we haven't worked together now since like eight eight years now so it's been a while but we're still we're still really best buds and we really love to help each other out and obviously network as much as possible so going back to when you start to want to get into hardscapes more you start this new business what uh what kind of projects were coming in at that time and where did you kind of get the ball rolling in terms of uh getting more hardscaping leads in the beginning of the business there well, we started off straight up mowing at first. We just said we got to grow a company and we had about 70 or 80 leads or so that we had we split in two. And basically I had my we, we let's say we cut, let's say maybe 40, 40. We just had 40 leads. And those clients obviously brought us extra side jobs, whether it be your heads, whether it be your um tree work or smaller, smaller garden projects. And we realized that you know there was a need. People were asking us more about. Oh, can you guys do walkways? Can you do pool decks? Can you do things? And it, eventually, like we never went into the pool deck thing, but but we said, you know, there's there's more of a. We started most mostly marketing from inside. There was no internet marketing at the time. We we start. I was probably the first guy in our area to ever have lawn signs, um, uh, little cheap black and white ones, and then we went to a little bit color. That, that was a big upgrade. You know, put the logo in color. That was, that was the the big the big closer for sure. But we always had brochures and door hangers and uh, just trying to to grow the word like that but eventually for me what was the big the big turning point in where we were going was that 
I started realizing that there was a little niche and a little niche. And this was like the lift and relay, the repair, the paper cleaning and sealing that was no one was doing it before asking us. Uh, they'd say, hey, can you cut the grass between the cracks of my pavers? Uh, I got the patio stones always coming up and we'd be cutting the grass and we eventually stopped doing it for free, uh, including our mowing pack, just because it would eat like all the heads off of our trimmers because of a, uh, and it would ruin all. You'd go through a spool of cord like no time. I'm like, I find a way to get like, what can we do? We could put cement. One guy just put cement. Cement joints didn't last, like it's like on the work. Then we heard about polymer sand and we started getting into that industry. And eventually I was like, this is kind of cool. Like, you know, it's a one-off job. We don't have to come back every week and do it. It's a little niche. And we just started getting more and more into that. And eventually we saw that there was a, a market, you know, a lot of our clients had, you know, homes that the papers start to sink after a few years, uh, loose steps and like that. We're like, why don't we just try going down that road? So eventually um, we shifted away um, this is all a lot of it. Most of this organic marketing uh, went away from uh, our mowing to specifically into more like restoration, hardscape, some new projects, but still with underneath underneath 5K. Like we never really went over that at the beginning anyway. Definitely. And with that, this is why it's so interesting. Actually, I, when I started my business, I started that lift and relay side of things because I noticed uh working for a supplier how many contractors were so unwilling to take on that work and how much of that work was out there it's such like a, uh, an amazing niche to kind of squeak in there and really make a name for yourself uh and and i want to get into this a little bit with you just to uh pick your brain about starting a business on the maintenance side of things for hardscapes specifically. Do you, did you notice the same thing in your market? Is this something that you kind of noticed in, in other markets as well, that there's this whole opening? And, and why, in your opinion, is there that hole if you see it? Well, this was something that we eventually um, discovered that there was more and more of a need for it. So I, I got rid of all my lawn mowing clients. I still did some hedges and things like that. And then we started just taking more and more of, the, of, of our you know, a piece of our pie of our company into the repair stuff. And we started doing some building and some projects and some and some some bigger projects. But we realized like there's always so many variables. Uh, you know, weather is is one thing, but like, you know, delivery is um, excavation. You got to check. You know, with the you know local utilities if there's anything buried in there. Uh, hit a gas line up. Sorry, along the way, and and a few other a few other crazy things have happened. But we realized that there's a lot of things that kind of come into play with a new project and everyone's fighting for the same piece of pie. And we're like, we got to get out of this game. And there's a really cool book. I think it's called Blue Ocean Strategies that uh, has really kind of helped me in the last uh, while. And, and the concept of it, I don't have all the, all, the, all the pieces of the puzzle, but the idea that, you know, you have a red ocean where you have like the sharks feeding and there's basically just like feeding friends. Everyone's fighting over the few fish and there's like just blood, there's mass, there's confusion, there's chaos. And it's way better to, to, to try to segue into a blue ocean where you're like, you're the unicorn, you're the unique person, you're offering a specific product, a specific message, and you're able to really clearly brand yourself as the expert. And that's really what we tried to do is say, you know what, I'm not ever going to pretend to be the best hardscaper out there. And there's, you know, tons of hardscapers that you know, that you guys interview that are doing amazing award-winning projects. And that's awesome. But I figured if I could be my expert in, in what I do and my lift and relay uh, and type of repair type of thing, I can charge a premium price, deliver a high value and deliver a really good service. And that ultimately what the client wants. And that's kind of where we started kind of going away from the bigger projects into um, into like uh, lift and relays, small uh, additions, small things, you know, accessories to make things nice. But we said, you know what, we're going to just set away. And then basically since 2000, um, I would say since 2013, really, that we started moving really away from from anything uh, maintenance related in terms of grass and into the the, the, the paver restoration uh, side of things. Do you find it's more of a systematizable business where it's uh, I don't want to say easier, but it's uh, for lack of a better word, easier to bring somebody new from uh, hiring them and getting them trained on the job because there's no customization required. There's no new design that needs to be uh, put into place. You're not worried so much about drainage. It's more so, unless there is that issue with it, but it's more so you've got this project, you pick it up, you put it back down or, or whatever it is. Do you find it is more, um, like, like I said, lack of a better term, easier to systematize this type of business? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm a lot easier and I'm not a, 
I'm not the type of guy that has to like, like my ego is not standing in the way to say, well, I didn't like, I can't build this like beautiful, crazy hundred thousand dollar pool deck or, or more. You know, I, I don't care uh, in the sense that I know that, you know, I don't, I know that, you know, it might, you might get a bit of ego by doing that. And maybe some guys are really well, but it's harder to scale that type of business because there's so many intricate ma- ma- pieces. There's a lot of craftsmanship and some guys do an amazing, amazing job, you know, uh tony from zamco this guy's just like breathtaking projects at montreal like you know it's beautiful stuff and like you know hats off and like if i can and i've actually you know we've connected before and and you know some projects need cleaning the ceiling and i can kind of come back around over and like you know after him and like help him out and like hopefully it's great we're all serving our little niche client and that's and then that's perfect however uh, like you said the word easier is is the word it's easy but at the same time we've really worked super hard developing really good systems whether it be video training um, written um, how-to processes um, systemized tools and, and specifics that we need and the guys learn very i'd say you're at exactly the point you brought up earlier you know really quickly we can get someone who's never touched um, a shovel before to get into you know almost to be able within a almost two weeks i'd say be really comfortable with what we do and how we do it and that's a way steeper learning a uh, shorter learning curve than, than than a lot of the newer guy newer design builds with a lot more in play and we still have to worry a lot about you know slopes and and you know quality materials and how it's built but we're not really worried as much as the whole excavation um uh, you know subgrade geotextile base it's not as much what we're doing we can offer it to the clients but we're usually it depends you know we'll get into maybe later on about who our ideal client is but but usually we're really looking to someone that you're either looking to sell their house or just bought a house and he doesn't want to do the whole the whole the whole kit caboodle wants to just do a little bit less and still build, still have a nice looking project i actually want to get into this now when a client reaches out to you um because this is how I, I started my business and I had like a set framework about how I took a client from contacting me to giving them options. And I still do lifted relays in my business, but uh, I just want to like compare to see how it, it compares to what, how you take a, a client from start to finish. But when a client contacts me about lift and relay, I'll, and I meet with them, I'll give them three different options or yeah, three different options. I'll say, Hey, we can lift the pavers, replace the bedding layer, re-level, put everything back down. Or we can, if you're not confident in the way that it's performed and we look at the base and it's like stone dust or something like that, we'll do a full excavation and replace the, or uh, put the pavers back down that as they are there. Or we'll do just a complete project for you. Uh, how do you go about this? Once a client contacts you, you take a look at their project. What do you do? What do you offer in terms of, do you offer them a couple different choices or do you say, I, I figured it'd be much easier to just give them one choice and say, this is probably the best for you. How do you do it? You know, I think that's a really good point because people, um, they want to be, they, they want to have a certain power in what they can choose. And I really like, you know, that concept of like, you know, good, better, best, um, uh, scenario and we use you know different softwares that enable us in our packaging we, we package everything we say i give you you know the deluxe the ultimate uh, the, the regular deluxe and ultimate packages and well one might just be uh, a simple you know pressure wash changing the sand uh removing all the oh, oh, clean the surface changing the sand put a new polymer then i might have one other package the higher quality polymer and then an extra package okay i'm going to clean um your the columns on the side of your of your house or, or the cement steps that's like a bit the, the ultimate package we have to we, we give different packages for that in terms of just the polymer sand replacement we actually interestingly enough uh, not many guys do this but we actually package our polymer sand service as a completely separate package to lift and relays so we'll say mrs jones here's one price for pressure washing your sand removing us remove all the joints clean the surface putting in new high quality sand proper compaction activation his set price boom if you want repairs it's an add-on service i'm like a, almost like a trio at mcdonald's you're getting the add-on and and we've done it that way because people were thinking it'd be so hard it was we're getting a lot of confusion with people that were saying oh well if you're doing the relay you don't have to do if you pick up the stones anyway not the pressure wash but they don't understand always that there's so much sand stuck on the sides and it's annoying to clean and time-wise it wasn't worth it so we figured you know just better to offer you know a package different services the main thing we we don't really offer the whole uh, excavation and, and, and restart in the base and all that 
we could offer it. We just don't have the manpower. I don't have the desire to. I don't want that headache. So we have a lot of really cool companies that companies in the area that we've partnered with that that will you know given us for example a list price. They say, oh, here's my price list, and you can either upsell it to your client or you can just give them the price and say, hey, we'll come in and do it and assume the best. You know. However, I usually you know I, I just stay try to stay clear of that. I would my ideal client. I'd much rather just pressure wash the joints, lift and really a few areas, and put it back down, and then add a good polymer sand. That's and then maybe a sealer monthly. Or that's really my ideal client. I'm not as interested in getting into the excavation part. That's where you see your profit. Our profit margin is where you start to drop drastically. You have to manage that. You have to warranty that, and you have to do a whole bunch. You have to basically. There's a lot more involved. I would much rather be one day pressure washing, one day lift and relay. I'm out in and out. I find that's where I get the highest profit margins or where we give our, it's kind of our niche. And it's kind of where we find that there's a, a the, our clients tend to be the happiest at that. Full lift and relay is design, changing the curves. We start to, we can still do it, but it's it starts to be more of a design thing. And the clients will realize that you only have so many bricks here. Like you can't really start playing around with the curves too much. And, and it's not ever going to be exactly the same by doing it that way. Maybe you want to look into design. And we, we turned down so many clients. We got 1,800 leads last year. I only met, I met personally 500. My, my sales team met over another 300 total. There's a, over half. We just say, no, we're not a good fit. And, and we give some virtual quotes. So we just try to develop really good partnerships with other companies in the area. And if I know that it's something out of my league, I'm like, you know what? Just call Tony, call Mike, call, call John, call these different guys. These guys are the best. And it's coming from a place of authority because we have you know, 165 star reviews on Facebook and Google right now. And like, we're, we're on the top of our game and people trust us. They call us because of reviews a lot of the time and, and they want us to do their work. Like, you know what, you have a great project, but I just can't do it. It's not our specialty. And people appreciate that. They appreciate the honesty that, Hey, you know, we're not the best. I don't pretend to be. And, and people beg us, please do my drive. I can't do it. I don't have the manpower. I don't have, you know, we don't specialize in this and you're, we want you to be happy with the result. Our, our, um, mission statement is pursuing excellence to deliver the best customer satisfaction experience ever and that is what we want to do oh yeah by the way we do landscaping on the side ultimately it's customer experience and that's what counts it's not about you know how fast i can lay pavers or or do i have the biggest greatest excavation equipment or, or the best equipment to do or the newest truck is the clients really care what they want with the experience we have we have a in, in our in our process a 21 point touch system so we're going to touch the client not physically but but either by emails or by phone calls emails texts uh, follow-ups 21 times in the minimum 21 times in the course of the life cycle of the client and you might say that's well, like a, sounds like a really invasive and a lot of people not really whenever you calculate you know the interaction they include all the crew interactions to and specifically the beginning of, of the job the midpoint touch the end point uh, the follow-up the walkthrough there's all these things that come into play that are all scripted into our process to make sure that we deliver that experience yeah i mean uh i love what you're saying i love that you have like the you you know the client that you want you know your where you're most profitable and you kind of stick to that you've got your client avatar that you are quite specifically looking for uh you mentioned reviews there's quite a lot of reviews how do you go about getting and acquiring and and keeping that going to get, to obtain that quantity of reviews so one of the ways that well we do it is the a few different things uh one of the scripts that we have uh, and even before the client um, has, before we show up at the door, is what we're scheduling uh, is one of the scripts. So we try different types of scripts. One of them is, you know what, hey, just so you know that our team is coming out to do your project today, uh, to do your project today or schedule the day and say, we're there for two things, to make sure you're amazing, you're, you're blown away by our service and to earn a five star review. And that's something that we want the office team to, to, to bring into a conversation. We want the project manager who goes up to the door to say that. The guys don't always say it. One of the guys, it's hard sometimes to get them to go. But 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 the idea is we want the word review to come in our conversation. And especially at the end of the job, we want to, I, I really try to stress with the guys. I stress that if I'm the, the project manager in charge of that job that, hey, have we met all the expectations? Great. Would you leave us a review? And they say yes right away. We have a, a text uh, that we can text them right away with a link because they're 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 never going to more inclined than now to give the give the review. This is even before they've been uh, we we've been paid. We're trying to get that review. We don't always collect it right away. We just have to follow up after. But even and let's say the client's on home, finish the job. We're not going to try to. We're not going to leave the invoice in the mailbox. 
Uh, we're going to wait. We're going to have the office team call and say, hey, Mrs. Jones, were you satisfied with the work? Is there anything that 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 needs to get done? And let's say this one's like, okay, one stone is cracked or one little thing. We'll go back and fix it. We're not talking payment. We're not talking reviews until all that's figured out. Because right away, if I start like, okay, I pay me now and I'm going to come back and fix that tomorrow. Right away, it's like, yeah, but are they really going to come back? And 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 it, and sometimes there's agreements that say, you know, it's going to be, you know, for whatever reason, we can't come back right away. Well, there'll be an agreement. The client will pay some, we'll come back. It, you know, for example, in the winter time, if a stone cracks in the month of end of November, we don't have time to next year, we'll figure something out. There'll be a clear communication, but the client knows we're not after their money. We want them to be, first of all, satisfied, which is in line with our mission statement, that we want them to be wowed. And so all this to say, once they're happy, once they they, they say that they're, fit, that they're happy with the, the results, we'll say, hey, uh, Mrs. Jones, you know, if we've delivered this, the, we're a small family business, we deliver, we try to v- deliver a high value. We hope you felt that value on the offer and say, yes, yes, yes. And once you get a couple of yeses, they're in the, you say, hey, can you, would you be so kind to leave us a five-star review or leave us a review if you want to be more politically correct? And right away, the office team, well, the office manager or the office assistant is on the phone with the client. Right away, they will send the link right away by text or by email, and hopefully they will fill it out right away. It doesn't always work, but at least it, it's the best. It, it's more authentic than just having an automated follow-up sequence, uh, you know, or, or a little banner on my, on my email saying, hey, leave me a review. I feel it's more authentic. And ultimately, like, if they're not happy, um, we don't want them to give us a review anyway, so we're not even going to bring that up right away. And it doesn't happen very often. Obviously, no one's... Everyone's got uh, their their horror stories, but ultimately, I think because of the follow up we've done before and how we pre vet and how our contracts are worded, it's very rare that like the red flags will come up a lot earlier, and we'll have to address that before we even get to the final stages. Definitely, and uh, kind of going back to the lift and relay thing, why why do you do the pressure washing prior to the lift and relay? Can you explain that process a little bit? Well, we we thought about different ways. Now, first of all, if it's a you know eighty millimeter paver. Uh, like a blue blue 80 for example um just picking it up whenever you're 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 you're, you know getting out the pickaxe sometimes it's really it's really hard to get out we were finding pavers the corners could chip and it was really really messy because you know you got like a dirty subgrade and you got a lot of like there's a lot of i felt just more muck and then you you take the paper you stack them on the side now you gotta have a guy with a scraper scraping the sides because if you don't get it perfectly back in you're not you're gonna, you're gonna lose like half a centimeter per row and by the time you get to the garage door uh you're off by three inches and now what and then you guys start cutting what if they had a soldier over there's an inlay pattern it gets complicated so we found that by unless it's like a for a small little repair we will and it's a, or a real real old sand we're really going to always recommend first of all pressure washing the joints cleans them all out but also the surface of the pavers are clean too. And if you go on an Instagram page, you can see a lot of the, you know, the, the stuff that we do. We really, the stones not only look, the joints are clean, but the surface is clean too. So the client right away is a wow factor. Wow, day one, they're already clean. They haven't lifted anything yet. So they haven't lifted anything up yet. Like we're, it's going to be a, we're going to be, it's going to look really amazing. And we use a lot of plywoods and geotextiles. The guys try not to walk too much. Uh, you know, on the side grade into the pavers and j- just to keep it clean as possible for when they're picking it up. And so we use tons of geotex, uh, tons of scraps, and we really try to, to, you know, treat the client's lawn properly. It makes it for less cleanup at night, at the end of the day. There is some sand that's going to fall anyway when you pick up, but it'd be a lot less. You're limiting maybe 80% of your sand. And so that's that was our concept of sometimes even if a client will only hire us for the pressure washing and sanding part, the pressure washing guy will pressure wash everything. And when he's done, he says, look, ma'am, look where the water is pooling. Now that we pressure wash, like the water is all pooling here in front of your door or pooling in front of your shed or, or by the pool deck. Like, just so you know, like our teams come back tomorrow and like fix that for you. And like give them a, our, our, our techs have a, our project managers actually have a, like a price list and certain prices. And they send me a picture where we were in a price. They're like, wow, this looks so good. They've already been wowed. We're, we're not trying to pressure them. We're just saying, look, if I don't fix this, there's going to be a puddle because Polymer sand will harden. It's almost waterproof. Water is going to just stay there. And they say, you, your pressure washer caused, one client calls me up and say, your pressure washer caused, you know, all these, all, all these craters in my, in my property. And now water's accumulating. I said, ma'am, I said, no, you get 20 year old sand. And we have this in our contract now to follow this conversation saying, no, ma'am, you have, uh, you have these, these craters before, but because sand was so old, the water just went through right through. But now that you have a good polymer in there, it's creating little bowls everywhere in little areas. And it's just kind of realizing that clients have to 
understand the expectations. That's why we're, we're super careful with our contracts, um, really trying to make sure the contracts are ironclad and we put pictures and displays and, and circle stuff and show them, make them sign on every dimension. Because if we're not picking up a whole drive with like this uh, and the paper's only sunk in certain areas, I want to make sure that every single area is itemized, picture, a circle, uh, a circle in the picture and signed. So the client has to like physically acknowledge. If not, it could be, you know, he said, she said, and it gets kind of uh, hairy sometimes. And clients just don't remember that they talked about certain things. And so it's really important for us to really try to make sure that we, 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 we identify with our clients, the areas they want to fix. And it's a clear agreement. Yes, we're doing this, 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 and for this much with a signed contract, you know, we a lot of e-signs we do, uh, but it has to have a signature and sign our terms and conditions before we start the project. Yeah, I mean, that that's super smart, especially I'm sure you learned that uh, through challenging ways to be able to refine your contracts to that point. Uh, a couple more things that kind of popped in my head when you said that you, you learn these things and now it's in your contract. Uh, what about, let's start with... Uh, your client just wants to have it pressure washed. There are these, or, or sorry, the client just only wants a certain area of the patio driveway to be lifted and relayed. Uh, I have found in the past that doing that, I, I actually have to kind of at least expand two, three feet out from that area to lift it, to get it to sit properly. And I've even gotten into the point in my business where I'm doing less, less lift and relays. I'm getting more and more picky. I don't even do that. It's either the whole project or nothing. Uh, but with you being a quite specific lift and relay business, how do you approach something like that? We have minimums. We have like a about a thousand dollar minimum to show up at a property. Gotcha. So if someone just calls me for a loose capstone, I'm like, look, ma'am, I'm I'm just not a good fit for you, right? I'm sorry, I can't. Like, if I was neighbor, the neighbor next door doing a project, and you call me, and they'll come by, and I, you know, I'll do it for not very much. But if if you're calling me to come by uh, for for a job, it's going to be a thousand dollar minimum usually. And, and we, like you said, we with levels and with with the right measurements, we factor in you know, the extra areas and they get fixed. You know, if, if the client says, "Oh, the water's pooling on five or six pavers on my wall on my patio," we know that it's because you know if if, if we can tell on the house that everything's sunk three inches, fixing those five or six pavers are not going to fix the problem. They're just going to send the water problem somewhere else. So, unless the client wants once everything picked up and relayed, and obviously whenever we go out, we show up with our consult, me or the, the consultation team shows up, we say, look, um, we can fix a specific problem, but you are we're going to give an option for the whole thing. And we'll say, if we only fix this area, we can do it, but you're going to have problems elsewhere. And, you know, to fix pavers, let's say it's about, give or take, eight, ten bucks square foot, whatever the, uh, the area is based on the square footage. But this is going to cost a lot less than potential risks to your foundation. And, and, and you know, uh, to just cheap out on this and, you know, water from the freeze thaw, we're up in Montreal here and tons of snow and the winter freeze thaw cycles, like it, it does a quite a havoc on, on patios and, and foundations. You know, it's a small price to pay for a $40,000 repair to your foundation. One thing I learned quite early on was at least if there's a certain amount of growth of weeds in the joints, it's almost better to just lift the whole thing and relay the whole thing as opposed to trying to pressure wash those weeds out of the joints. Because I found uh, at least in a particular project that I did and when I was first starting out that I was just pressure washing the weeds into the joints as opposed to popping them out. Uh, and you know, you almost have to either, you know, pick out each individual weed or lift and relay the whole thing. Have you found the same thing? Have you, uh, I know that you guys run uh, quite interesting equipment. I, I think it's a hot water pressure wash, but also you've got the spinning head uh, protection there. How, how have you found that? If there's certain weed growth, how do you take that? Yeah, so if the client, um, if you can tell that there's just really established, uh, very thick dandelions or very thick type of plants, sometimes you got trees growing in there, like we're telling the client, look, we're going to have to pick up a relay but i would say 90 percent of the time we can we use high high power high powered you know honda gx 690s or or honda uh, 390s um uh, big big engines they go through a lot of gas and they're and turbo nozzles are the way to go they don't damage the surface as much as let's say uh, uh other nozzles that are out there so overall like we'll get rid of most of the weeds through the turbo process i think for example if it's you know those cheap uh 
those cheap 18 by 18 patio stones, like those I will not pressure wash between because they will disintegrate when you look at them. Uh, we're going to pick them up, replace them, remove them, and put them back down. So many of those are not to spec. It's ridiculous. Like it's so those those are 100% uh, no, hard no on that. But when it comes to regular pavers, um, unless I feel they're really disintegrated, we're going to still go ahead and pressure wash and sand. Um, most of the time it's okay. However, if it's a jungle back there, we're going to do exactly what you said, you know, pick everything up. Um, rip everything out we put a new geotextile and, and redo this upgrade we'll see but overall like i'd say it's very little of my business has to be where like, i tell the client you have to pick everything up so it's not uh, it's not really uh it's not really a, an issue for us as much we find that it's been more of a actually the fact that we don't have to pick up because of the equipment that we use because of the, the prep team that goes in before the restoration team usually the guys that are doing restoration don't really have to worry about weeds that much at all but you're right sometimes they do push down but but overall with the pressure that we're going at and then the volume, most of them come out. We have a two-year warranty that the weeds won't come back um, on regular circumstances. Obviously, if it's on the edge of a soldier row and, you know, you, the edge of strain is terrible and it's opening up, it doesn't count. But most likely, most jobs will get very few little to callbacks. And usually any callback happens in the first month. Because I mean, look, there's thousands of joints. You're going to, you might miss one or there might be a pesky weed that got, that got missed. Look, it's going to happen. That's why we have a two-year warranty. And then you mentioned uh, about 1,800 leads last year. Where are your leads coming from? Where do you find the most uh, luck with the leads? Is it mostly word of mouth? Do you also pay for online ads, offline ads? Like, how do you go about getting those leads? Uh, we use a uh, lead automation uh, company, um, lead collection agency called WebRunner Media out in Montreal. And they're a really awesome company. Super, they're doing, going through a lot of growth this, these days. And they're, they're really... Uh, they're very good at what they do. And we want to deal with a company that was also French that could understand the French language. Cause I'm not sure where, where are you out at? What, what area are you in? Toronto. Toronto. Okay. So you guys don't have to worry about one language. So, so finding software, finding companies, it's been kind of tricky sometimes because um, a lot of them being American, really good American companies out there doing uh, marketing, but it's hard to find someone to change your copy to French and understand a bit about the market and, and some of the law, law language laws we have here. So, uh, web runners are really good uh we rely a lot on our branding we have bright green trucks all our trucks are bright uh, wrapped bright uh, satin apple green um colors um we use lawn signs we'll use we'll do five rounds the neighborhoods make sure everybody gets the door hangers nearby it says like hey we're in your area working you have a question let me know uh, we rely on facebook marketing well I, I guess the the lead automation they to answer your original question they work with google and facebook ads and so there, there are other uh, pay-per-click campaigns or, or, or exposure or impression campaigns. And we'll run different campaigns for eight, six to seven months in the year. That's where we get the bulk of our leads. But the best leads are always word of mouth, referrals, family and friends, fellow contractors, really trying to work on developing that this year, um, networking with these people to make us all, all better. Nice. And we've mentioned quite a bit about the sales process already. Uh, when it comes to a lead coming in, initially contacting you, and whether that's through email uh, or a phone call, how do you take that? How do you, we, we also talked about like your ideal client. How do you go from initial lead to, uh, you know, asking them questions or whatever you do in terms of identifying that this is a, a somebody that you're willing to give your time for a consultation to? Excellent. Excellent question. Um, I don't answer the phone at all. It's been three years now. I don't answer the phone. We have an office uh, administrator, office manager doing an amazing job. I don't, I can't, it just doesn't uh, make sense for me to answer the phone. I'm doing other things in the business. And uh, these guys, these ladies actually are doing a phenomenal job. We have systems in place, scripts for everything. So let's say you call me, Michael, and say, hey, I want to quote. First thing we're going to ask is your address, make sure we're in the right zone. We're going to ask what type of work you want to have done. And then we're going to make you work for it a bit because we're going to come to your house for free for an estimate. You have to give us something back first. We're going to ask, uh, first of all, for your, I want to know where you live. And usually while the the, the the customer service rep is on the phone um they're typing in the address right away and they're looking at the project they're looking at the house and if it's a house like kind of the one in the background here uh a million dollar house we'll just go there right away because most likely there's more than one thing to do um but if it's a little you know old house guys at asphalt driveway and you know a couple loose steps that might be in the front we'll say look um 
we do have project minimums. Could you please send us a few pictures first? And we'll ask a couple, couple of knockout questions. If the person says cheap three times in the first sentence, in the first conversation, I don't want to meet them. They're not our, our client. And we, we do charge a premium, but we are, you know, I believe uh, one of the premier companies that do what we do. And so we don't want to, we want to make sure that we're a good fit. You know, if you, if you want a Ferrari, you don't go to Toyota. And it's it's not that I say that with, with I'm not trying to flex. It's not that we're a better company, just the way we're building our model. We're trying to service our clients with a high level of, of, of communication. And that costs money. It costs money to have a sales team. It costs money to have people in the office. It costs money to have um, good uh, people in the team, you know? And and so we just tell our clients right away, like, you know, I don't think we're a good fit for you guys. If, if, if we feel right away it's not a good fit, we'll say, hey, we have a friend that we can refer you. Or we have someone that we know that's in your area that we can refer you. And it's always very polite. We never want to ever make someone feel that, like, they're they're subpar, that they can't afford it. It's not the point. We obviously want to know from the conversation, uh, first of all, what their needs are, what their pain points are. And from then on, we can either refer them away or we can say, hey, ask for pictures. And we often ask for pictures. And if, and if they can't send us pictures in 2021, especially after this pandemic, everyone, even grandmas, no one to open the PDFs and take pictures on files. So like, there's really no excuse for not being able to take a few pictures and send them to us. Uh, we're going to send a, a team to uh, me to your place <clears throat> or one of our sales guys who is going to give you, you know, a full evaluation, a written estimate, you know, a, 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 a document, a, doc, a proposal that will be a professional proposal. We're going to take that time and we'll do it for free. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure you're a good fit for us if we're willing to do that for you. And we do charge occasionally a consultation fee if it's really far out of our zone or if the client's really being picky um, and or if the, the lead is being very picky or kind of rude. The office team knows how to handle that and just says, you know what, we obviously value respect. And if they can't give us respect, well, either you pay and we'll show up, give you a quote or you prepay actually. A credit card or or we're, we're just you know we'll, we'll refer you to someone we try to keep positive and ultimately we're not going to fit for everyone and we try to, to to present ourselves in the best possible light but but we have to still uh, respect our own time respect our team's time because ultimately they have to uh, put bread on the table and we can't do that if we just follow every single lead unfortunately you mentioned uh, free consultation, free proposal. Why? What? What is your mindset around doing that for free as opposed to charging for a consultation, unless it's far away? That's the, that's the reason. Um, we are working with a market that people don't understand quite the value of what they're getting um, in terms of the cost. Like they think the our biggest price obje objection to hiring us is price. People will say you're too expensive. How much can it cost to get rid of a few weeds? But they don't realize, you know, when you're doing a project, you know, change the entire sand. It's it's two visits. It's high quality polymer sands that we use. Um, these are all things that come into play um, when we're doing a project. It's not just a, you know, people have a vision of like going with a knife, pulling a few weeds, and putting some sand. And it's like the vision they have, or or they had they had, they had their brother in law come over and and sprinkle sweep a few bags of sand and wet it, and the, and they called it done. <clears throat> we're offering them, you know, a a full service, a guaranteed service that will extend up to 10 years, you know, on their project. And, and we want people to know that, you know, we are, we want them to know kind of a range of what we're, we're doing. We try to give them a range before we come of what it's going to cost based on similar projects. But we find that the, the stepping for, to, to charge for a consult at this point, people are just not really going to bite. They're like, oh, like we're, they're already going to be a bit shocked by the price to begin with. So, we want to really push value, push value, and really in our in our in our follow up emails and our lead emails, how we present ourselves to really put ourselves in the best possible foot forward. So, overall, I think we have a pretty good closing rate on that. So, I'm not quite worried about that. If things were to majorly change, might have to rethink. Especially since you're going through the motions of pre qualifying and and uh, you know having that office staff there to specifically quite do that pre-qualifying yeah i think uh that that makes a lot of sense when it comes to payment plans what i've struggled with in the past if i'm taking on a small job that i'm just like using to fill a hole uh if it's below a certain amount i tend to be too len lenient on that and just say you know what just pay me when the job's done it's like a one two day job uh how do you go about payment plans because you do so i i would assume a, a wide variety of small to large projects based on what you're doing uh do you handle it differently from job to job do you have a set payment plan and structure for clients how do you do that well our office manager she's really good at, at, at making sure that a client does not get in the list, uh, the schedule actually, until they've done two things. 
they have to sign our, our contract, which is, includes terms and conditions when I say that, and they have to pay a 25% deposit, no matter how big or how small, 25% minimum. If it's a, a bigger project, we'll still ask for 25 and 20, let's say it's a, the client wants to change the stones in a driveway, uh, we want 50% before we can start the project. So at day one, I got to have the other 25%. Uh, really big on that, especially with credit cards these days. There's no really reason why someone can can't just pay instantly. Um, we've already shown up at a client's house and they're just like stalling us, not wanting to pay. We're saying, well, we'll just come back whenever you're ready to pay. And usually that takes care of business pretty quick. And and it's actually helped us that a couple of people that are tire kickers and some clients just absolutely refuse to give a deposit. And, and I'm just saying, how much is this worth? And I start to like try to ask you questions like, uh, how much are you charging per hour anyway? Or like, how much can this cost anyway? Or like, how much do you pay yourself? And I'm like, I'm sorry, sir. Like, we charge a all inclusive price. I will charge you more if your joints take up more. So I don't want, and I won't charge you less. They don't. I said that's our price. Um, no surprises. That's it. And and usually this any tire kickers that don't want to pay deposit or they want to deal with cash. They're not going to be our client anyway, and, and that really weeds them right out. But 25% is, is our is our quota minimum, and then usually a bit more But the first day if it's a few-day project. But most of our jobs are two days. So um, it's not like if we have massive overhead that, that, that is kind of linking over us. We're not really floating equipment over. So it's really not that much of a – we're comfortable with 25% as of now. And we're going to probably next year almost go exclusively credit cards, um, checks or credit cards. Um, we don't – we want to we we uh, we try to get people to do more e-transfers and, ca- and checks still this year but we're going more and more towards a cashless society so there's no really per- point in really pr- prolonging it and people it, it is a few uh, points but people i mean points on your for, for, for your credit cards right up to three percent and it, it hurts a bit but at the same time knowing that you're going to have your cash right away knowing that people have this illusion that their points are going to get them somewhere um on a small amount even i don't think i mean point value is it's so little. I mean, I'm I, I'm a bit of a, a credit card a geek. I like to like research credit cards and figure out like the best point values and things like that. But like most people, like your TD card is going to give you something, but you got to spend like tons, like years of stuff to get an application. Like it's not, it's not all, all and sometimes the cards, points expire. And anyways, long story short, people, people, if they have this illusion of their points, that's good. And if you're really careful and spend a lot of money, that's great. But most people are not going to get that vacation pay it on points let's just be honest but if it's in their mind they're happy with it go for it yeah i agree and especially if like at the beginning of the year you're, you're budgeting you kind of are budgeting a sales amount you can just add that percentage points into your budget and it's taken care of right there and then if you do get a check you know that's that's added bonus to uh your bottom line when it comes and I, i'm gonna ask this now because we just talked about payments uh horror stories uh, you've been in business long enough i'm sure you've had your fair share uh, it can be around payments that we just discussed. It can be around anything on the job site. What is a horror story that you'd want to share with us to help us kind of understand what con- what comes with contracting? Uh, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Do you have a horror story you'd want to share? Yeah, I could have a few, but but one of them that really stuck out was um, a client two years ago where she signed the contract, paid the deposit. Um, big multi-million dollar house like well he had obviously had money and we did a bunch of work for her um when we finished the project she but she hadn't like again it was a, a repair it wasn't a complete repair it was a partial repair so we did we put in a drain in front of her back steps because i wanted to, she wanted the water drain out we did certain repairs at certain areas in the property put in a trench drain along a or a drainage pipe for, for the gutter um a few little things but she hadn't selected like every single service that we had given her uh priced her for uh, and at the time she had said i don't want to do this under this so we just redid her contract and only gave her the thing she wanted um we all finished she's like well i don't like how this looks i'm like well look we have a contract agreement um you agreed to this she's, I, I agree like okay this is extra i'm like, okay so she said how much to fix this I'm like, all right well it's going to be you know three thousand dollars to pick up the rest of the pavers that we originally were not going to of this part of the property that we were not going to fix because you didn't want to do it at the time. So she's all right. I said, $3,000. Are you okay with it? I had, my employees are there. She says, yes, I agree. Um, so I should have had a change order filled out. I didn't. I was like, look, the lady was nice. She's bringing us like cookies and drinks and all types of stuff. We're like, this lady's the best, you know? Um, then later on in the project, there was something else. She's like, well, could you like do, I don't like how this drain looks. Can you remove it? I said, yeah, but if I remove the drain, which I just put in, 
you pay me to do it and it's going to cost, you know, another 2000. She says, yes. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Right. I said, look, ma'am. I said, we're kind of, instead of how we had been at the beginning of the project and we just said no drain, I would have re-sloped the papers all a certain way, but now I slipped them all into the drain, which is not there anymore. So now we have to re-slope them. So anyways, this, it ended up being almost um, like $7,000 of change orders on like a $20,000 uh, $20, project. So it was 27 by the end of it. And I go to get paid and she's like, no, I'm not paying. I'm like, ma'am, like you verbally agree, like right there with all the employees. She's like, but you have a little clause in your, on your website that says 100% satisfaction guarantee. I said, okay. She says, yeah, well, that means that I'm 100% satisfied, so I don't have to pay for the change orders. And this lady's like an engineer. Like, she's not like a dummy. I was like, ma'am, like, this is absolutely ridiculous. Like, you're 100% <laughs> satisfaction guarantee. Anyways, long story short, um, lots of discussion with her, a lot of back and forth. We had to meet like halfway. So I lost a bunch of money on it, <clears throat> but it was a lesson. Like, and my office manager was like, yeah, you should have gotten a change order. I'm like, yeah, you're right. But the, the point was it just, it was, it wasn't even like a bad relation with the person. Just, it was, I think deceit, unfortunately on her side or, or craziness, but, but just, it was a good lesson for us. And, and from then on, we have told uh, I, the office manager will not put a schedule. I mean, it's not her fault, but we will not add anything with not a change order. And that's just how we do it. And that's how I think we're going to keep ourselves out of trouble because there's all types of crazy people in the world. And <laughs> Definitely. No, that's a, that's a great story and a great uh, lesson to share here. Uh, just a few more questions. Feel free to spend as much or as little time as you want with the, these uh, here at ET. Tools, equipment, installation practices, anything that you want to talk about, uh, spend any amount of time on that kind of you really stand by in your business. Could be small tools, could be big equipment, could be uh, any installation practices uh, that you stand behind in your business. Yeah, well, we've actually um, really love using roller compactors um, since they kind of start coming out. I know Weber has one. We have a Weber one. We have a couple from Mikasa. Um, we like the Mikasa ones because they're kind of compact and they're small, easy to move around. They are really heavy, right? So we have roller compactors that that we we love to use. I probably broke like one paver um, last year and consider all the, the jobs that we've done, like really it doesn't scuff the pavers and break them. It's also fast. You can roll a, a paver driveway super quick with as much consolidation as if you plate tapping it. So we can really go back and forth really quick because uh, it's a roller, you can variable speed it yourself, right? And so we've really been using roller compactors a lot as like every truck has at least one in there and it's really a bit efficient with, with our, um, for the work we do. So usually we'll jumping jack um, the base, uh, big plate it, grade it, then we'll put down, um, then we'll bury it back down and roll it. And so, and also for the, whether it's just a lift and relay or if it's a, only a polymer sand replacement, the roller compact has really been our, I think our key to making sure papers don't get scratched. And people appreciate that, that we're not damaging the, the property. Um, we like to use a lot of tools from Great North. Great North tools, I think, throughout Mississauga. They're they're a really good vendor. Um, they use a lot of the they carry a lot of the stuff. I guess in the states, it's uh, Pave Tool. Pave Tool. Thank you. Yeah, Pave, Pave Tool. Tool. And uh, based the the Canadian version of that, right? And a lot of the the Halder sledges, Halder equipments. Uh, the guys love the Halder, the Simplex uh, eighty sledge. They each have like names, like like there's names associated with these hammers because we use them so often. You know, one was called Bernie, uh, you know, and, and I don't remember what the other one's called, but, you know, we, we all have like different, every truck has like their own name. And like, if I say, go get Bernie, like, you know, like that's some serious thing to do. And, and uh, it's, it's really, we love those tools and we've used um, MQIP for vacuums. Uh, they're out in Ontario too, Mississauga as well, or around there. Um, MQIP, really cool. The backpack, two man backpack uh, lifters for like larger slabs. We really love those as well. Another thing we've done a lot of is um, we don't necessarily do like a new project as much, but using Gatorbase from Alliance uh, has been really cool because, you know, it enables us to do um, small, you know, additions. Like if the client has a patio, they want to extend it. We can extend it really quickly without having to bring in big equipment. And one last one is uh, we install these custom cranes in all of our trucks with um, battery powered, uh, like basically um, hyd not hydraulic, um, um, winch electric winches 
to lift up our roller compactors and tools into the trucks. So we, we work with flatbed, our standard trucks at 550 with a 12 foot bed. We, we install a couple um, um, Husky toolbox on the side or the, you know, Weatherman boxes that you just put all the tools in, seal them out of the rain. We have big toolbox for all the tools, but then when it comes to the rollers, um, we have like a, a winch that'll come come out with a, a crane and then just pick up the the rollers, put them back in. And it's really a bit of a game changer for the guys because, you know, they are heavy. And, and especially when you're picking up to pick up to like a flatbed height, it's it's past your your optimal reach for two guys anyways. So it's been really cool to use those uh, those winches and we got them welded in all of our trucks and the guys love them. I think it's, it's a cool retention tool, too, because we're always using the top of line tools. We're not trying to we don't I don't. I don't have any patience for broken tools and we really try to keep our guys happy with the best stuff on the market. And we're always learning. We love going to trade shows and conventions learning about stuff. And I will not shy away from spending big money on tools if it makes the guys effective and if they are um, happy with the results. Yeah. Those are, that's a great list of uh, things to get into now. Uh, anybody that you'd want to give a shout out here on this podcast, mentors, people that have helped you, whether offline, online, people you look to inspiration, anybody that you'd want to give a shout out here. Yeah, well, you know, my dad is a big inspiration for us, you know, to to make it about the people that we hire with, work with. You know, at first I I made it almost too much with the people because I wasn't making money and I was hiring all types of people that needed help or something or to try to like to, to come alongside friends. But uh, he was a big help with that. I, I've learned a lot through the online community through, uh, you know, through courses that like Techo Block has offered um, through coaching, uh, different various coachings, coaches that I've had through the years. Uh, I love uh, BTA Academy. Um, those guys are awesome. I'm a member of them for now a year, and it's been really, really, uh, really good to help systemize a company and uh, really to get to to be able to um, uh, to be able to to learn more about about uh, you know how different business owners are doing it. I really love their approach and stuff. And I am personally, I'm a I'm a religious guy. I'm a Christian, and to me, I give God the glory. It's uh, it's not up to me. I think he's given me talents and skills and to me, all glory goes to him. Like it's not, not me. I think uh, we've all been given gifts and uh, I just want to use it to, to make the most out of it. Excellent. And my final question to you is if you could go back, uh, what is one thing that you know now that you wish you knew from the very start, whether it was you first started Boeing or you first started your business, what is one thing that you know now that you wish you knew from the very beginning? Can I answer that in two parts? Absolutely. I'll answer that to like the 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 the, the me starting twelve years ago or thirteen, and the me starting today. All right, because I think it, it might be a bit different. Uh, twelve years ago, I would have gone and worked for someone, uh, maybe for a year, or, or 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 gotten a mentor, worked under someone, and learned the trade more. Um, I I didn't quite know much about it, and I kind of learned a lot just by trial and error. And, you know, first couple of years, look back at those old uh, year ends and man, like they weren't very, I could have like worked at McDonald's and made more, but, but, you know, that was trial error, maybe it made it go the way I am. Also, I would have learned uh, more about numbers, um, knowing my numbers, uh, understanding a budget, understanding uh, what it costs to be in business and what are the, the ups and downs of being, uh, you know, a business owner, understanding, you know, overhead recovery, understanding, you know, uh, projected expenses and, and all these things that, I use LMN, but the LMN budget, the free version, and I love it. It's a really great tool. I'm so glad they do it for free because it's a really, it's really helped me and a lot of other contractors I know really know what to charge. And, and not when you're charging, if someone says that's expensive, you can say, well, this is my cost of doing business. So if I if I literally say, I'll give you a discount, I'm taking food off my table. And with I have a wife and three kids, like it's their it's their future that's being on the line here, right? I don't work for free. So it's, um, that would be the old, that would be what I would, what I would tell myself when I started off then, um, work for a mentor and have, um, and have a, a better grasp of numbers. Now, if you're starting a company in 2022, I would say invest heavily in two things, software and the right tools. Software being the importance of, you know, especially in, um, and for, for, for estimating, for follow-ups, for phone answering services, um, uh, pricing softwares, CRMs, that's a key. Like there's no way you can, well, you, if you want to take 10 years off, save 10 years of your life, do that. You leverage the, the power of software. We spent about $7,000 on softwares this year, uh, various different phone answering services, CRMs, uh, quoting softwares, uh, accounting softwares. 
and it takes you'll save a lot more um, by spending money on software than you ever will hiring this year the person to that role, especially now at the labor market that is where it is. Uh, if you can leverage software to your to your advantage, uh, and even the fact that we can sometimes get quotes out within 24 hours so quickly, or, or using in Google Street View and like measuring out properties and sending them a quote virtually, people were blown away. We we still got you know we almost signed hundred thousand dollars of virtual quotes this year. I never even saw the property just by pictures and dimensions that were sent to us. So really cool. Uh, secondly, would be you know using the right equipment, especially with the labor shortage. Once again, not that we're uh, you know, blaming the labor shortage all the time, but but it, it, it is a reality and using, making sure that you you have in your team the right tools and make it attractive, make it people, they, they see that they can kind of work in your team as it being a, a sustainable career uh, for their health and also, you know, pay them a living wage and make sure that the guys can, can have the right equipment so that they don't burn out in, in two years and say, man, like, my back's down, I can't landscape anymore, or I can't hardscape, you know? And so those are the two things I would say for for the me now that we're starting, I would really uh, focus on technology uh, being number one and also the right tools for the job to really as a retention tool as well. ET, I really like this discussion. Thanks so much for joining me. Where can our audience learn more about you, what you got going on? Uh, I'd say Instagram is the best way. Uh, Lege Landscape, that's L-E-G-E-R, Landscapes, L-A-N-D-S-C-A-P-E-S. Uh, or check out our website or just type in um, paper restoration in Montreal and we should be one of the top hits on uh, on Google or for the reviews. But it's been a lot of fun, Michael, chatting with you. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to have me on and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Go check out more from ET at Leger Landscapes. That's L-E-G-E-R Landscapes on Instagram. He's got a great live series on Wednesdays in the evening where he brings on somebody that he'll interview on his channel there. Lots of great information that he's got coming out. And once again, check out the budget and estimate spreadsheet at howtohardscape.com or the members only platform members.howtohardscape.com. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.